I'm going to finish up what we've been doing for a while now. Um, we've been in the book of Judges, and I thought I would end up with this, this scripture because Samson's life was such a mess, and this makes me think about just how bad Samson was at times, and, and this really points to what he lived like. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. We, we know from Samson's story that he ended up dying from really a lot of bad choices, from following his lusts. And I think about that. I mean, he just he just chased everything. And uh, go ahead and switch sides. And I just kind of this is kind of a review in some ways. It's kind of crazy how uh, it starts with. Joshua and them coming into the promised land and Joshua knew evidently or I feel like he did because he'd seen in his lifetime that they could not follow they could not live those li- they could not live the life that God called them to live they couldn't stay away from the idols they couldn't stay away from the other gods they, for, for any time length they couldn't do it and so it's an interesting story uh, I mean I named my son Joshua and probably partly because of that first verse and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day who you will serve, whether the gods of your father served, or on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in those land you dwell. But if for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And then here's his last statement to the people before they went into the promised land, before we get to the story of all these judges. And Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen you to the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will serve. We will serve, and his voice we will obey. Well, if you know much about the story of the judges, they basically just hung themselves with what they said. They were, we're, we're witnesses to ourselves. It's kind of like when you make a promise and you don't keep it. And I just... Let's just have a quick prayer. And dear Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for these stories that show us how flawed we are. And it shows us how we should be living instead of how, like Samson lived, where he lusted after his eyes, and everything he did was all about meeting his own selfish needs instead of about worrying about what God had, had designed him for. And that's, that's our call, too. We, we're designed to do greater things than what we sometimes do. And I just ask you, Lord, that you bless us this day. In Jesus' name. So, when I look back, and we've gone through the whole book of Judges now, and this is kind of the end, and next week I won't get off on baptism. Uh, but the thing that I kind of laughed, we, Larry, the other day, kind of gave his testimony about grandmother dragging him to church his whole life, and, and uh, that's awesome, just the idea she did, that she stayed on top of him. And in this story of the Judges, Back in chapter 14, there's this crazy, hello, there's this thing, um, there's this crazy deal where the parents actually go down with Samson to Timnah to get this woman for him. Now, it says in verse 5 of chapter 14, so Samson went down to Timnah and his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, how weird is that? that two faithful parents would actually go with him down to this sinful place and help him pick out a sinful wife. You know, and you, we can all throw that logic around in our head, but, you know, I guess we try to support our kids. We try to do what's right for them. But it's just strange to me that, that, she, that they even went, because I know what grandmother would have said. <laughs> just quit it. She never would have gone down there with them. She'd say, just quit it. And, and, and that's, you know, we are, we live in an age where we enable our kids. Uh, 
I see a lot of it where people, instead of drawing a line and stopping the behavior, they kind of go along with them to kind of oversee them and make sure they don't get in too much trouble. That's not our calling as parents. It's not to just oversee and enable them. It's to actually tell them, look, this is wrong. This is a place to stop. And so that's kind of the story of Samson. Samson was a selfish guy, the ultimate selfish guy. And uh, so we're going to continue. We're in chapter 15. Where we left off chapter 14. If you remember right, uh, last week he, uh, he had done this riddle and um, at a wedding that was thrown together for him and his bride that was of the, the wrong faith. We'll just say it like that. Um, and his, this is the first signs that women are going to get Samson in a lot of trouble because he's allowing them to, to do things to him and it's just a foreboding of what's coming next. But if you remember right, um, he kind of had made a bet with the 30 guys that were at his wedding, which they had to be brought in because he didn't have 30 friends because of his nature. And so that here's these 30 folks and they uh, basically he um, hit them with a riddle and if they could solve it, he was gonna buy them all clothing, but if they didn't, they were gonna buy him 30 sets of clothing. Well, Samson, if you remember, in the, I'm going to verse 19 of chapter 14, it says, Then a spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to the Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave the chains of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused, and he went back up to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. So we left off. Instead of going and buying new clothes, he just went and killed 30 people. I guess that's cost-effective. And it also, and you know, here's the crazy thing in this story. God's will was to remove the thing that was harming the Israelites. And it was the other people in the land and their religion and, and their lifestyle and their culture. God's will was that to happen. The crazy thing is, is Samson was the unwilling participant. He did not realize that he was actually effectively doing God's will. So there are times in life when people, when somebody will do something for the greater good who's absolutely evil because it's in God's sovereignty and God's plan. So we, it, it's kind of one of the craziest stories. I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it because, you know, Samson makes it into the hall of faith in Hebrews. And I, and I, and I, I still struggle with that because only God knows his heart. He knew where he was. And I guess at that last moment, which we'll get to today, I guess, you know, he finally understood who God was and what his destiny was supposed to be for God, but he never lived it. And that's my biggest fear for everyone in our church, is we have a destiny. We are set apart. We are called to do something for God. We have, we have a, a, a great amount of potential in God's kingdom. And uh, one of the things that I, I got the other night while I was praying, closing up at Chrissy's house, there are so many people in that room that have messed up like Samson, have lived a life that's so far outside of what any of us could even understand, have gone so low, broken so many laws, done so many horrible things to their family and friends. And during those times, the devil was telling them, you're an unfit mother. You're an unfit person. You're not worthy. You're not capable. You're, you're not even, you, you don't even matter to anyone. All that matters is to take care of that need, that drug, or whatever it might be. Very selfish, and the devil puts that in, in your heart. And, you, and if you take it to heart, then we have things happen like we talked about with, with the suicides and so forth. You, you know, you, I'm unworthy. And, I, and in the church, I think we have the word, I'm unqualified. I can't serve because I can't sing, I can't play, I can't do all these things, I can't preach. The devil is the one that puts that voice in your head. I'm unqualified. But I tell you, there's a better voice. One that says, I am redeemed. I'm a child of God. I can do all things through Christ Jesus. That voice, the voice of, the, of God, the one who can change you, convert you, and, and, and redeem you. And, and, you know, and, the, and I guess the thing that's most amazing when I do the Christie's House ministry and I'm involved with all those people our God is a God of redemption, but it's on a level that you can't even fathom because these people not only get their lives back, they get their families back. 
And in many cases, they've been removed by the state. The children are gone and adopted. But at some point, God's goal is to put lives back together, families back together, to make whole people and to accomplish things. So you cannot tell me that if you're a child of God that there's not anything you can't do that God called you to do. You're not, I don't care how unqualified you think you are. God will qualify you. He will empower you. He'll make you do things that you cannot even fathom that you can do. And and I just, and I know that for my personal self. I mean, you know, 10 years ago when I started to preach, I didn't look up for five Sundays. They, they thought I was just, I mean, this is me. And I'm reading like this and I'm not going to look up because there's people out there and they're just scaring me, you know. But if you continue to walk and you continue to pray and you can live for him, you can live outside of your situation. You can grow beyond that. And, and here in Samson, Samson like the ultimate answer, uh, example of the worst. And, I, and there's a lot of scripture here today. We've got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. But So Samson, he goes back to this wife that he thought he had. And he left so angry when she gave the other guys the riddle, the answer to the riddle, and he had to give up the 30, change the clothing. He goes back to his wife after a time. He is one weird dude because he's like, he's a newlywed. He never consecrated the marriage on the seventh day. He went away, and now he comes back to the story, and he brings a young goat. And believe it or not, bringing a young goat is like bringing a dozen roses. If I brought my wife a young goat, she's kind of a farm girl. That might be the same thing there, too. I don't know. But uh, but anyway, she's, she's kind of different. But it's just one of those stories. But anyway, so he goes to the father, and he says, let me go into her and be in her room with her. And... He would not let her go in. Come to find out he's given the wife to the best man. And you think about that. In their culture, you know, that was just, that, believe it or not, that was the best man's job. If the husband chickened out, you're next. That, that was just the way it worked. And so I imagine the father was a little bit afraid and intimidated by Samson because they all heard the stories of what all he had done. And so he offers the younger sister. And that would also be how the culture was at that time. And so Samson got angry, as Samson often did. He's hothead. He said, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. And then Samson went out and caught 300 foxes. And they actually say they're in that part of the world it would have been jackals. That doesn't make them any easier to catch. But and, then said, and he tied their tails together. He put a torch between them. and let them run all over the Philistines' land. And set everything on fire, all the fields. And it was the time of harvest, so you can imagine... How bad that was it wiped out all their store grain everything they had was burned up because of it so he's really made the philistines like a like a swarm of, of hornets against him at this point and then in, in verse 11 it says then three thousand men well actually it's back up to uh, verse 10 and the men of judah said why have you come up against us to the philistines they're afraid the men of judah are not afraid because the philistines are riled up so they answered we have come up to arrest samson to do to him as he has done to us and then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock in Elam and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is it you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. Now, that's a crazy th thought to think that they don't want Samson to remove or fight against the people that are over them. And to give you that in a modern sense, it's like you have something really horrible in your life and it rules your life and runs your life and you don't want to give it up because that's just the way things are. And someone who is the judge, the redeemer, the one God has sent to bring you out of that, you don't want to do it because it looks like it might not be successful. Might not be. And that's what I see in this story is the Samson's life is like a miniature version of what's going on with the Jewish people. Everything he goes through, they go through. You know, and it's crazy that they, you know, that we, we, we have great hindsight when reading it. We weren't there. But they couldn't see that the Philistines were not someone for them to be worried about. They need to be worried about what God's thinking instead of what the Philistines are thinking. But they said to him, in verse 12, it says, But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hands of the Philistines. And of course, Samson says, That's okay. He still's got his strength. He knows where he's, what he can do because of God. Swear to me that you will not kill yourselves. 
And so they spoke to him saying, no, but we will tie you up securely and deliver you to their hands. And of course, they tied him up with new ropes and they delivered him. And this is kind of foreboding also for what happens at the end scene. And of course, they release the Philistines. They get all excited. They see him down there tied up and they come running like crazy, hooping and hollering. They're going to take care of him. And of course, the minute God's spirit falls on him, he rips those ropes off and goes to town. And he grabs the, um, the fresh jawbone of a donkey and he takes it up and he kills a thousand men with a donkey. Now the other, the other couple thousand ran off. And I come to find out, I was wondering why the fresh jawbone of the donkey, number one, it won't crumble, but they actually use those to till with. So it would have been something that would have been laying around. It was like grabbing a farm implement for a weapon and coming up and going crazy. This is prior to all of the weapons that they had. It was prior to the Iron Age, but anyway. And then Samson, who evidently was smarter than we realized, he was all full of himself. He, he, he quotes a poem. He says, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I slain, have slain a thousand men. He does poem to, to, to his thing. But you notice he says, I have slain a thousand men. He never ever gives God credit except for two moments in his life. He never lives into his vow, ever. He never is a person who follows with, but yet God still uses him. And, and that's really hard for me as a pastor to, to follow, but God has his ways and we don't understand. But in verse 18, we, we hear that one time that he asked for God's help. He said, he became very thirsty. He cried out to the Lord. After you kill a thousand men with a, with a farm implement, you know, you're going you're gonna to be thirsty. You've given us great deliverance by the hand of your servant. Listen to that sentence. You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of your, the uncircumcised. So he, he, he's admitting for a moment that God gave him power to deliver. And so and she said, now shall I die first? So he reaches out. He's going to die out here in the desert after he killed these thousand men. And so God split the hollow place that is Lehi, and water came out, and he drank. Therefore, he also called it by name in Hapador, which is Lehi to this day. And, and he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Samson only lived 40 years. God had a much longer plan for his life, but he only lived 20, I mean, 40 years total. That's not much, even by their standards, especially biblical men, famous men, people that God called. They typically had pretty good lives, pretty long lives. And so Samson um, gives God this much credit. God does a crazy miracle and busts a rock open and the water comes out and he's, he's saved. But like I say, he only gave God this much. And, and immediately we go to verse 16. It says, Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot. What's the next thing he does? He goes to Gaza to see a harlot. And when the Gazans were told Samson has come here and surrounded the place, they lay in wait for him at night, all night in the gate of the city. He sneaks in. They know he's there. He knows they know he's there. And so he sleeps with the harlot. He gets up in the middle of the night and kind of sneaks out. But well, they've already blocked the gate. And so to make a point of, I guess you'd say, just to show off as he did, as he always did, he takes the gates of the city, he rips them out of the ground, posts and all. And from what I understand, sometimes those gates were as much as six feet thick. And he drags them halfway to Hebron and leaves them on top of a hill just to make a statement. And he did that in, under nightfall so the men couldn't get him. So that's kind of... It, it, this is Samson. He, he is so full of himself and what he can do. And what's so crazy, as I told you before, I don't believe Samson was physically a large man. I don't believe there's anything special about him. I think the Holy Spirit and the power of God's Spirit was the only reason he could do anything. And so for a man to be in that situation and, and not understand that God gives him most power, I mean, it, 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 he, he understood it enough at that one moment that he needed some water. But no other time is to give God any credit or any glory. So I ask you today, do you give God credit for when you succeed? Do you give God credit for when things happen and, and, you, and you're blessed? And, do you, and I know we all reach out to God when we're in a bind, but do we give him credit for the good days too? So then that's kind of, Samson just really missed it. Anyway, so we, and Samson and uh, finally goes down and hangs out with Delilah. And I'm trying to get through this pretty quickly this week. And you remember the story of the prostitute where 
earlier, she, he finally told some of his secrets to her. We've got the same problem again, except on a much deeper level. And the thing about Samson, I guess, I've, me and preacher buddies of mine talked about him. Why did he finally lose all of his power? Uh, and he actually did had not broken the third of the three things he wasn't supposed to break until he allows Delilah to shave his head. The first thing was no drink. The other thing was not to touch anything clean. He had never actually broken the third part of that vow. And my thinking is, it's just like, kind of like me as a kid. You tell me you don't, don't do that, nothing happens. You tell me don't do that, nothing happens. Well, surely if I don't do this third thing, ain't nothing gonna happen. And I think, I think that's really what he was thinking. He, he really personally thought he was invincible. I think he really thought he was the one with all the power and not God. And do we, we also get like that ourselves. So anyway, we're going to, we're going to read the ch chapter 16, verse 4. After it had happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah, and the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and what means we may overpower him and we may bind him and afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Five kings... 1,100 pieces of silver, and I think 1,100 pieces of silver is like 50 times the annual wage anyway. It was like $11 million or some crazy amount of money they're offering Delilah to tell off on him. So yeah, she's probably going to bite, I'm just being honest. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with you, and what you may be bound to afflict you. Men, are you going to answer that question? What's your weakness so I can hurt you? I mean, would you ever answer that question correctly? I mean, that's just insane. But like I said, I truly believe he was so full of himself that he thought if I tell somebody my ultimate weakness, it ain't going to make no difference. It's me that's got all this power. It's me that's got this Superman quality. It's me that has this ability to do all the things. God had not anything to do with this, so it's okay if I tell her. Plus, I really like her. She's cute. And that's the way men sometimes think. Anyway, so, and Samson said, If you bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that are not yet dried, I will become weak and like, be like any other man. And of course, that wasn't it. And he broke the bowstrings and when the Philistines came in. And she always acted like she was helping him. The Philistines are here. Look out. And of course, he, that, I guess that gave her some sort of uh, excuse as to why she was the one causing it. And then now she, verse 10, she says, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So here we go, round two. If they bind with me, with securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I may become weak and be like any other man. So we're getting closer and closer to the truth, but not yet. And so the same thing, the men are lying in the inner room of the house. I'm sitting there thinking about it. You've got a room full of Philistines in your house, waiting to jump on you in your bedroom. He's got to be asleep or drunk or something for all this to go down like it does. Anyway, and finally he gets really close. He says, if you weave seven locks of my head in the web of a loom, so she did that, same thing, same results. They come rushing in and she says, Samson, the Philistines are here. And of course it doesn't work. And then of course I played the woman card last week. Remember she cried on him and all that and made him, made him finally tell, well, here we go. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? Anybody ever heard anything like that from their bride, ever? You have mocked me these three times and not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily. She was a professional nagger. She did this every day. I mean, just think about that. And pressed him. You know, here he was, he could, he could kill a thousand men, but he couldn't overcome a nagging woman. That tells you about his character, doesn't it, a little bit? So his soul was vexed to death, and then he told her all his heart and said, and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, and I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. I am, sha I am shaving. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called to the Lord of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, and for he has told me with all his heart, so the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. 
And then she began to torment him. This is crazy. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before and another time and shake myself free. So you see what I mean? He even believed it was him. He believed it was his strength. It was what he believed it was what he could do was going to change the situation. It was you could he felt invincible. It was all about self. And this is the most saddest line in the whole Bible. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. You got me? That's the saddest line in the Bible. He did not know that the Lord was not with him anymore. Think about that for a minute. His whole life, God had been with him. But he finally broke the last vow, the last piece, and God said, okay, you want it on your own? You got it on your own. The results are horrible. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, and they bound him with the bronze fetters, and they gave him a grindstone in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. They give us that line to let us know something's about to happen. His hair's growing back. God's going to give another chance. I mean, we all need to think about that for a minute in our lives. God's always there for us. We live in a different era, a different time. We have Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We have, we have things available to us in a different and better way than Samson ever did. But by the same token, we can never, ever be like him. Because if you, when God leaves you just like Samson, you become spiritually blind. The world can blind you to the point that you become useless to God. And for that moment in time, Samson could no longer be used by God. And that's my biggest fear with us being full of ourselves and not reaching out and not living into what God calls us to do is that we don't follow his word and his will for our lives. So verse 23, we continue in the end, the end of the great Samson. Now the Lord of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered him into our hands, our enemy, the story of our land, and the one who has multiplied our dead. So it happened with their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they had him like chained up like a monkey, and they brought him out in front of them. And so they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by his hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And about 3,000 men and women were on the roof watching while Samson performed. So think about that. The entire leadership of all of the Philistines was under the roof. And on top of the roof were the 3,000, they called them devotees, which is interesting because Delilah's name the devotees, I guess you'd say. Um, Delilah's name actually means that. So she was probably up on the roof too. They were all worshipers of Dagon. They were all believed in that God. And, what he, and, and, and that some people believe that Dagon's a predecessor of Baal and some of the other things that come later again. Anyway, um, then Samson called to the Lord saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may be with one blow, take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Now, this is where I struggle with Samson's faith. He's still not doing this, to my way of thinking, for God. Let me take vengeance on them for my two eyes. Even though he lived his whole life apart from God. He did everything wrong. Now God did still use him, didn't he? He did. God accomplished his will through him. But he was a, a man of great strength, but he never became a great man. Do you get the difference? We all can be, can do something well, 
but do we become great people for God? Do we become who we're supposed to be? You know, he, he only lived 40 years, and his life ended so horribly and tragically. Now, he took, he went out with a big bang. If you want to be like a guy, woo, like the end of a Rambo movie, he went out, you know, he went out, and, and I guess you'd say that kind of glory, but, and you know, and it did glorify God because God's mission was to remove the Philistines and their culture from his people, but it's still, I still struggle. And so it's in, then finally we hit the, the final thing. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right hand, one on the other on his left. And then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So in the dead did he kill that his death were more than he killed in his life. And that's really Samson's epitaph. He killed more people on the day that he died than he killed in his whole life. And his brothers all came, his father's household came down and took him and they brought him up and they buried him between Zorah and Esau in the tomb of his father Manoah and he judged Israel for 20 years. What a story. So we finished Judges. It's crazy. It's the most up and down thing I've ever seen. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord which had been done for Israel. So Joshua dies, and the elders die. And I know Brother Robin, as a pastor of a church, once he leaves that church, he doesn't want that to stop. He doesn't want the mission to end just because he's not there or the elders aren't there and the next generation comes along. You don't want it just to veer off. But in all these stories, once the leader was gone, or once the elders were gone of the church, they always, they always got way off mission. And, you know, our job more than any other thing is to, to raise children who will turn out to be future disciple makers of, for Jesus Christ. And so when we get to the end of the Judges 400 years later, and it says in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It's like we never accomplished anything in the whole book of Judges other than we saw a million examples of the Christian life up and down and up and down and walking with the Lord and following him. just we see all these examples of how we shouldn't live and by far to me Samson is the, the horrible example of selfishness and living wrong and I just uh, I hope that we can take that away I pray today that you understand how qualified you are how God qualifies you he qualifies you with your heart he doesn't qualify you with anything else if you follow your heart for God, everything that we need to accomplish as a church will come to pass, and everything in your own personal life. And you'll start to be redeemed and reformed, and, and all of the parts and pieces of your life that are messed up will get fixed. And I just pray that you would do that. We, we end at the same place we started. I ask you today, who are you and your house going to serve? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word today. And it's a it's a long diary story. It's a lot of words. It's a narrative. It's, it's the, not the typical thing that I preach on to. But, Lord, I just thank you for the examples of both the Israelites who had fallen away and not lived like they should, and Samson himself, who at the very last moment, the very, very last blink of his life, said, Lord, I will do whatever it takes if you'll just give me the strength. Can we all say that prayer this morning? Just, Lord, I will do whatever it takes if you'll give me the strength. That's where we need to be every day. Lord, I'll do whatever it takes if you'll give me the strength. And I, I pray this morning, if there's any that don't know Jesus Christ personally, that you would come to the altar. If anybody else is, that needs prayer or whatever, we're here. I just thank you, Lord, for this time this morning, and I thank you for your word. And just, Lord, let your Holy Spirit guide us and lead us as we leave here today and help us to Touch our hearts, and Lord, we just thank you for this time. And we worship and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's all stand, please. Turn to page 111.